Men of Iron by Howard Pyle Introduction The year 1400 opened with more than usual peacefulness in England. Only a few months before, Richard II, weak, wicked, and treacherous, had been dethroned, and Henry IV declared king in his stead. But it was only seemingly peaceful, lasting but for a little while, for though King Henry proved himself a just and merciful man, as justice and mercy went with the men of iron of those days, and though he did not care to shed blood needlessly, there were many noble families who had been benefited by King Richard during his reign, and who had lost somewhat of their power and prestige from the coming of the new king. Among those were a number of great lords, the Duke of Albermale, Surrey, and Exeter, the Marquis of Dorset, and Earl of Glorca, and others, who had been degraded to their former titles and estates from which King Richard had lifted them. These, and others, brewed a secret plot to take King Henry's life. This plot might have succeeded had not one of their own number betrayed them. Their plan had been to fall upon the king and his adherents, and to massacre them during a great tournament to be held at Oxford. But Henry did not appear at the lists, whereupon, knowing that he had been lodging at Windsor with only a few attendants, the conspirators marched thither against him. In the meantime the king had been warned of the plot, so that instead of finding him in the royal castle, they discovered through their scouts that he had hurried to London, whence he is even then marching against them at the head of a considerable army. So nothing was left them but flight. Some betook themselves one way, some another. Some sought sanctuary here, some there, but one and another they were all of them caught and killed. The Earl of Kent, one time Duke of Surrey, and Earl of Salisbury were beheaded in the marketplace at Grincaster. Lord Lee Dispenser, once the Earl of Gloucester, and Lord Lumley met the same fate at Bristol. The Earl of Hun Huntingdon was taken in the Essex Fens, carried to the castle of the Duke of Gloucester, whom he had betrayed to his death in King Richard's time, and was there killed by the castle people. Those few who found friends faithful and bold enough to afford them shelter dragged those friends down in their own ruin. Just such a case was that of the father of the boy of the story, the blind Lord Gilbert Reginald Falworth, Baron of Falworth and Easterbridge, who, though having no part in the plot, suffered through it ruin utter and complete. He had been a faithful counsellor and adviser to King Richard, and perhaps it was this, as much as more than his roundabout connection with the plot, that brought upon him the punishment he suffered. Chapter 1 Miles Falworth was but eight years of age at the time and it was only afterward, and when he grew old enough to know more of the ins and outs of the matter, that he could remember by bits and pieces the things that happened. How one evening a knight came clattering into the courtyard upon a horse, red-nostrilled, and smeared with the sweat and foam of a desperate ride. Sir John Dale, a dear friend of the blind lord. Even though so young, Miles knew that something very serious had happened to make Sir John so pale and haggard and he dimly remembered leaning against the knight's iron-covered knees, looking up into his gloomy face, and asked him if he was sick to look so strange. Then those who had been too troubled before to notice him sent him to bed, rebellious at having to go so early. Miles remembered how the next morning, looking out of the window high up under the eaves, he saw a great troop of horsemen come riding into the courtyard beneath. where a powdering of snow had widened everything. The leader, a knight in black armor, dismounted and entered the great hall doorway below, followed by several of the band. He remembered how some of the castle women were standing in a frightened group on the landing of the stairs, talking together in low voices about a matter he did not understand. Expecting that the armed men who had ridden into the country height had come for Sir John Dale, none of the women paid any attention to him. So he went off down the winding stairs, expecting every moment to be called back again by one of them. A crowd of castle people, all very serious and quiet, were gathered in the hall, where a number of strange men-at-arms lounged on the benches, while two billmen in steel caps and leather jackets stood guarding the great door, the butts of their weapons resting on the ground, the staves crossed barring the door. In the anteroom, was the knight in black armor, whom Miles had seen from the window. 
he was sitting at the table, his great helmet lying on the bench beside him, and a court beaker of spiced wine at his elbow. A clerk sat at the other end of the same table, with inkhorn in one hand and a pen in the other, a parchment spread in front of him. Master Robert, the castle steward, stood before the knight, who every now and then put to him a question, which the other would answer, and the clerk would write the answer down upon the parchment. His father stood with his back to the fireplace, looking down on the floor with his blind eyes, his brows drawn moodily together, and the scar of the great wound that he had received at the tournament at York, the wound that had made him blind, showing red across his forehead, as it always did when he was angered or troubled. There was something about it all that frightened Miles, who crept to his father's side and slid his little hand into the palm that hung limp and inert. In answer to the touch, his father grasped the hand tightly, but did not seem otherwise to notice that he was there. Neither did the black knight pay any attention to him, but continued questioning Master Robert. Then, suddenly, there was a commotion in the outer hall, loud voices, and hurrying here and there. The black knight half rose, grasping a heavy iron mace that lay on the bench beside him, and the next moment Sir John Dale himself, as pale as death, walked into the antechamber. He stopped in the very middle of the room. I yield me to my lord's grace and mercy, said he to the black knight. They were the last words he uttered. The black knight shouted out some words of command, and swung up the iron mace in his hand, strode forward, clanking, to Sir John, who raised his arm as though to shield himself from the blow. Two or three of those who stood in the outer hall came running into the room with drawn swords and bills, and little Miles, crying out with terror, hid his face in his father's long gown. The next instant came the sound of a heavy blow and of a groan, then another blow and the sound of one falling upon the ground, then the clashing of steel, and in the mirths Lord Falworth crying in a dreadful voice, Traitor, Coward, Murderer. Master Robert snatched Miles away from his father and bore him out of the room in spite of his screams and struggles. He remembered just one instant sight of Sir John lying still and silent on his face and of the black knight standing above him, with the terrible mace in his hand stained a dreadful red. It was the next day that Lord and Lady Falworth and little Miles, together with three of the more faithful of the people, left the castle. His memory of past things held a picture for Miles, of old Deacon Bowman standing over him in the silence of midnight with a lighted lamp in his hand, and with it a recollection of being bidden to hush when he would have spoken and at being dressed by Dickon and one of the women, bewildered with sleep, shuddering, and chattering with cold. He remembered being wrapped in the sheepskin that lay at the foot of his bed, and of being carried in Dickon Bowman's arms down the silent darkness of the winding stairway, with the great black giant shadows swaying and flickering upon the wall. Below were his father and mother, and two or three others. A stranger stood warming his hands at a newly made fire and little Miles, as he peeped from out of the warm sheepskin, saw that he was in riding boots and was covered with mud. He did not know, until long years afterward, that the stranger was a messenger sent by a friend at the king's court, biting his father to fly for safety. Then Deacon Bowman carried him out into the strangeness of the winter night. Outside, beyond the frozen moat, where the reeds stood stark and stiff in their winter nakedness, was a group of dark figures waiting for them with horses, in the pallid moonlight. Miles recognized Father Edward, the prior of St. Mary's. After that came a long ride through that silent night upon the saddle-bow in front of Deacon Bowman, then a deep, heavy sleep fell upon him in spite of the galloping of the horses. When next he awoke, the sun was shining, and his home and his whole life were changed.